Welcome to episode 10 of the Bits of Q series on template metaprogramming. In the previous episode, we created our first algorithm to manipulate tuples, tuplecut, which allows us to concatenate two or more tuples. In this episode, we'll have a look at two more tuple algorithms. We are going to create a transform function, which will allow us to transform a tuple by applying a function to each of the elements. This is similar to the standard transform function, which you might apply to a vector. But when transforming a tuple, we can of course use a transformation function, which has different output types depending on the input. This makes it a very powerful tool for manipulating both types and runtime data at the same time. We will then continue to use the transform and the tuple cut from the previous episode to create a filter function. Next to a tuple, this filter function will also accept a predicate as input, which specifies which of the element types are allowed to pass through the filter. But first, let's write this transform function. We are back in Visual Studio Code with the code we wrote in the last episode. I only made one minor change to the test framework off screen. I added an assert EQ, which gives better feedback if two values passed to it are not the same. Other than that, all the tuple code, as well as the meta programming header, are still exactly the same as before. So let's scroll down and start with the transform function. First, we'll create a test using our tester with builder, which, as explained in the previous episode, is going to execute the lambda we give to it with different builders. In each lambda execution, the builder will be configured to create whatever we pass to it as either a const or non-const, l-value or r-value reference. This makes it easy for us to spot any inefficient copying or moving that may happen with certain input types. We will also use the copy counter again to track how often our tuple gets copied as we pass it to our transform function. We reset the copy counter to ensure our statistics aren't influenced by passing an instance to the builder. For our actual transform function, we forward the tuple to handle both the L value and R value case correctly, and then we pass a lambda that should be applied to each of the elements in the tuple. To demonstrate the power of this transform function, I'll create a lambda whose return type is actually dependent on the type of the element that's passed to it. We use a C20 template lambda for easy access to our type name T here, but the same can be achieved with a C14 style generic lambda by using that call type on the other parameter. If we are passed an integral type, we cast it to int and then add 2 to it. Otherwise, we will use the knowledge that in this specific test case, this implies that we have been passed a copy counter as an element, and as such, we'll just return the stats of that counter. So in contrast to a normal std transform, which you might use on a vector, here the output type has elements of different types. Our input will be a tuple of int, copy counter, and unsigned int, but our output will be a tuple of int, copy stats, and another int. As a first test, we will check if the type of tub2 is indeed the expected tuple of int copy stats int. Of course, if we now compile, we get an error as we haven't written this transform function yet. There we go. Use of undeclared identifier transform. So let's go to the tuple header and fix that. I've already added some comments for the functions we'll be implementing in this episode. Transform is a template taking a type named tub for our tuple and a func for our transformation function. Since transform is going to return a newly created tuple, we can use other return type deduction. We also make the function const expert because we should be able to execute it at compile time. We accept the tuple by forwarding reference, but for the function we can just accept it by a reference to const. We will only be executing it, we won't store it or change it. So by accepting func as a reference to const, we now clearly communicate this to the user through the function signature. The plan is to simply create a new tuple by using transform on the result of getting the different elements. As in earlier episodes, we will create an underscore impl function to which we pass our tuple, as well as an index sequence of the size of our tuple. We use std remove cvrefT because tuple size doesn't work on const or reference types. We create transform impl in the detail namespace. Aside from tub and the func template parameters, we also have a parameter pack of indices which we use to specify our index sequence as a third argument. The implementation of this function is now a simple one-liner. We create a tuple with as elements the results of applying our function f to the get of the indices applied to our tuple. We expand the parameter after the closing parentheses of f, so f will get executed for each of the elements in the input tuple. And that should be it. Let's build and see if our static assert passes. Indeed it does. So we've now verified that at least the output type of transform is correct. Let's also verify that the content of our transform tuple is correct. We are adding 2 to element 0 and 2, so that should be 44 and 14. We build and run the tests, and that also passes.
Now let's think for a second about the number of copies or moves that we would expect here. We are passing our copy counter by reference to the lambda. In the lambda, we only read from it to retrieve the copy stats. So in the lambda, there should be no copies or moves. There's also no reason for the transform itself to copy or move the tuple pass to it. So we expect that the copy stats which are returned are all zero. Zero default constructs, zero copies, and zero moves. And indeed, this is the case. Great. We've created a transform function that works on tuples and used it to transform a tuple of 42 C and 12 unsigned to a tuple of 44 C dot stats and 14. Now it's time for a more challenging function, the filter function. First, a high level overview of our approach. We want to implement a function that given a tuple and some predicate, returns an output tuple containing only the elements for which the predicate evaluates to true. We will use a two-step approach here. First, we do a transform, and for this transform, we will use a transformation function that is going to use our filter predicate. If the predicate is true for the given element, it will return a tuple containing just this element. Otherwise, it will return an empty tuple. In other words, it will wrap elements that pass the filter into a tuple. So for our example, if we call transform with this function f, on the tuple of blue, yellow, blue, yellow, wrapped will be a tuple with four elements, an empty tuple, a tuple with a yellow element, another empty tuple, and another tuple with a yellow element. Next, we are going to tuplecat the contents of our wrapped tuple. We'll create a small wrapper function around tuplecat that is going to apply this concatenation to all the elements in our wrapped tuple. Since concatenating with an empty tuple does not do anything, the resulting output will be a tuple with two yellow elements, exactly what we want from our filter function. This way we can express filter as a simple combination of a transformation and a tuplecat, two functions which we have already implemented. So let's go back to the code and give this implementation a shot. For the filter function, we will use a similar test setup. So I'll just copy the transform test. We again use a copy counter, but let's make our tuple a bit more interesting. Let's add a float here and a double for the fourth element. And now of course we want to use filter here. So we'll again use std forward to pass our tuple, but now we also pass a predicate to filter the tuple as a template parameter. Let's go for std is integral, a type trait from the standard library that has a true value member defined for any integral type, such as the int and the unsigned int in our tuple. We update our static assert. We now expect the resulting type to be a tuple of int and unsigned int. The 42 and the 12 should be the only elements that pass our filter. Again, since we filter out our copy stats, we expect this element to be untouched. It should not have been default constructed, copied or moved. We compile and as expected we now get the use of undeclared identifier error. So let's go back to the tuple header and write a filter function that can accept a predicate and based on that predicate filter our input tuple. We will use a template template parameter for our predicate and a normal template parameter for our tuple. Now for the implementation we first write the lambda that we are going to pass to our transform. Let's call it wrap if pred matches, as it wraps the element into a tuple if it matches the predicate. I'm again using a C plus 20 template lambda here, and I'll say if const expert predicate of remove cvt of alum colon colon value is true. So if our predicate matches the element type, we will return a tuple containing just that element, and otherwise we return an empty tuple. Now that we have our lambda, let's apply it to each of the elements of the tuple using our transform function. We'll call the resulting tuple wrapped tub. So if your predicate is something like the std is integral we used in our test, wrapped tub might look something like this. A tuple with a combination of wrapped integral types and some empty tuples for the elements that did not match the predicate. Now we want to do a tuple cat of all the elements of our wrapped tuple. So let's create a new function in the detail namespace called cat tuple content that is going to do this for us. We'll pass it our wrapped tuple, which we can just move because we know it's an L value, and we'll also pass an index sequence of the size of our wrapped tuple. We'll use this index sequence, as we've done many times before, to retrieve the elements of our tuple and then pass them into another function. In this case, tuplecat. The implementation of cat tuple content is straightforward. By accepting the index sequence as an input parameter, we can just tuplecat the result of getting the elements at those indices. So, looking at the commented out example, after cat tuple content, the resulting tuple will be a tuple of int and unsigned int. Or at least, that's the theory. Let's compile and see if I made any mistakes. It looks like I did. Error. Implicit instantiation of undefined template tuple size of remove cvref. Ah, I forgot an underscore t here. 
I was passing an instantiation of the remove cvref meta function instead of the resulting type. An easy fix. And now we compile again, and it looks like we're good. Our tests pass. Let's have a look at the test and think a bit about what we actually tested. We have verified that given this tuple and the predicate is integral, we can filter out everything that does not match the predicate, resulting in a tuple of int unsigned int with the correct values. And furthermore, the copy counter wasn't copied or moved, so we know that we are optimally handling the elements that are filtered out. But what about the elements that are not filtered out and actually end up in our output tuple? They are more interesting, of course, because they actually need to be copied or removed depending on whether our input is an L value or an R value. So let's create a second filter test. I'll start by copy pasting the first test. When we were testing the performance of Tuplecat, we could simply compare the copy statistics of the standard library version to our version. But here there is no standard library version. But we can reason about the expected number of copy or moves as follows. If an element does not pass the filter, nothing happens to it. So we expect no copies or moves. We just verified that in the previous test. But if it does pass the filter, it needs to be assigned to an element in the output tuple. Clearly this means that for those elements that end up in our output tuple, the number of copies or moves needed for a normal assignment of those elements is a lower bound for the conditional assignment that is done by our filter. So we will create a reference tuple, which will just assign to another tuple, and then we'll compare the statistics of the copy counter of the reference tuple to the one from the tuple that's actually filtered to make sure that the application of the filter operation does not add any overhead. We'll use a new copy counter for the reference tuple, and we then create our reference tuple in the exact same way as our tub, but with our new copy counter. Then we do an assignment of the reference tuple, of course forwarding ref tuple to properly handle L value and R value cases. We'll need to use a different predicate for the filter, as we now want our copy counter to actually pass the filter. So let's just negate the previous predicate. We'll create something akin to a is not integral predicate in a bit. And lastly, we update the asserts. We now expect the resulting type of our filter to contain all elements that are not integral. We update the asserts, checking the values of the elements. And now for the most important part of this test, we compare the copy counters of tub2 and the reference tuple. In other words, we are verifying here that assigning an element is just as efficient as assigning an element when it passes the filter. As such, the filter logic does not add any overhead. To make this test compile, we still need to create that is not integral predicate. In contrast to is integral, there is no is not integral in the standard library. Now we could easily write an is not integral, of course, but since this is a metaprogramming series, let's make things a bit more interesting. We will instead use std is integral, but then negate it. As in, we are going to write a little meta function that can take an arbitrary predicate as input and then give you a new predicate that does the exact opposite. We'll call this meta function not underscore. The underscore is needed as not as a reserved keyword. And I think this would be a nice addition to the method program header, so let's just go there. Not will accept a template template parameter to represent the predicate, and then the type member will be a veridic template, as we want to return a predicate that itself can take an arbitrary number of inputs to check. For the actual predicate to return, we can use an std integral constant from the standard library. We'll configure it to represent the Boolean constant, and in particular the outcome of applying pred to RTs but then negate it. So what's going to happen here is, if you, for example, pass an std as integral, then this becomes an integral constant of bool and not std as integral. Now we see that everything compiles, but also that our test fails. So apparently we are not yet optimally handling the elements that pass our filter and end up in our output tuple. When we compare the copy counters, we see that two additional moves are made in the filter function that do not appear in a normal assignment. So let's have another look at the filter implementation and see if we can explain these statistics. We see here that we create this wrapped tuple, which is going to contain the elements of our original input tuple as values. And then we move it to cat tuple content, which means all those elements get moved, including our copy counter. So that's going to be the first move that is not strictly needed. The second move happens when we move the elements as part of our tuple cat. But we can easily fix this in the same way we handled the necessary copies and moves in our initial tuplecat implementation. Instead of storing our intermediate tuple with the real elements of our input, we'll just make a tuple with either L value or R value references to our input elements. We can do this by changing the tuple constructor into a forward as tuple. Tuplecat will take care of turning these references back into normal types for us.
This is because at the moment our tuple cat implementation assumes that all elements are values. Something I'll get back to in a bit. If we now compile, we see that all our tests pass, meaning that we can filter tuples and handle both the elements that pass and the ones that don't pass the filter optimally. But as I said, we made some assumptions when writing our tuple cat about tuple elements not being references. And similarly, we also completely disregard the possibility of reference elements when designing the filter function. Let me demonstrate one of the problems that results from this with another small test. We don't need a builder for this test, as this will go wrong regardless of whether we have an L value or an R value input tuple. As input tuple, we will use a tuple that contains a combination of integers and a reference to an integer. We will now try to filter this tuple with this predicate std is reference, meaning only the elements that are reference types should pass this filter. We can then assert that the type of the output tuple is a tuple with a single element, the reference to int. And as you can already see from my linter, the static assert fails. Let me compile to show you the complete error. Static assert fails because the empty tuple is not the same as a tuple with a reference to int. In other words, our tuple 2, the result of our filter, is actually an empty tuple. So clearly something went wrong here. And this is an inherent problem with the choice to reuse our transform function, whose lambda accepts an element as a forwarding reference. And since forwarding references always seduce to a reference type, there's no way for that lambda to distinguish between an element being an L value or an L value reference. So what I'm going to do is the following. I will push this version of the tuple and math program headers to GitHub, and will fix leaving this problem as a homework exercise. I will also include an updated version of the main.cpp file, which contains six new tests that will guide you through updating the filter and tuple cat algorithms to properly handle reference types. Each test will include a hint on how to approach it, and making it pass should only require adding or updating a few lines. If you are serious about getting better at metaprogramming, I highly encourage you to give this a try. Of course, I will also upload a solution to GitHub in case you get stuck. That was it for this episode. In the next episode, we are finally going to start this section on high performance metaprogramming. So if you are not yet subscribed, make sure to do so now, both to help the channel and to get notified when the next episode airs. I'll see you then.